All right, friends. Sorry. Whoa, that's a little loud, isn't it? Sorry to be a little late starting. So, did you give some thought to this one? We were solving the, the problem. We'd identified some substructures. Put it together. What do you think? It is a molecule. Good. All right, you've got the one proton that's adjacent to six. You've got six identical protons that show up as a doublet. That means they're adjacent to one. So we have two pieces of evidence for what's called an isopropyl group. And then you have a methyl group on the other side that's adjacent to nothing. All right, chemical shift wise. The isopropyl group and methyl group show up around 1 ppm, whereas the other two show up in the range of 2 to 2.5. Two so you know that your product has a carbon-oxygen double bond. So the solution that comes out of this is methyl group on one side, carbonyl, CH group, and then two methyl groups. All right, does that sort of make sense? Questions about how we get that conclusion? So we just discovered a new reaction, or rather you just discovered a reaction you're gonna learn in 352. Um, we said the mass difference was 14. Uh, comparing where we were uh, in the starting material versus where we are now, it looks like we lost a proton and replaced it with a methyl group. And in fact, that's exactly what has happened. You'll learn in 352 that protons that are alpha to carbonyls are more acidic than protons that are not uh, because the corresponding conjugate base is stabilized by resonance. So in 352, you will form a molecule like this that's called an enolate. It's the conjugate base of a ketone. We'll talk about why it's called an enolate later in, in 352, but then that enolate can act as a nucleophile. I'm not going to draw the resonance stabilized form, or, or rather the other resonance structure. You should be able to sort of see in your mind what that looks like. Then you can take that enolate and have it act as a nucleophile to do SN2 type chemistry on an alkyl halide. And that gives you this product and the reaction overall is called enolate alkylation. You're adding an alkyl group to the alpha carbon of a carbonyl compound. All right, so um, this is how we can tell that uh, reactions have happened. All right, so we'll do a few more examples and I'll try to give you a sense for the kinds of questions uh, you can expect. So let me just go to where a lot more of the practice spectra are. All right, we can actually take any of these. So let's just go with, surprise, that one. Okay, so whenever I see a list in the IR of all of these peaks, I assume that, that's kind of fun. Um, I assume that there may be information there, but it's, I, I'm not given any particular sense of what the peak shape is, so I'm sort of gonna shrug my shoulders and say, I don't know that I need to worry about that. Um, also, I see in the molecular formula that I don't have any oxygen, so I'm not looking for an OH group or uh, a carbon doubly bonded to an oxygen group. It's possible some of these are the characteristic sp3 hybridized carbon hydrogen uh, types of peaks. It's also possible there's some peaks corresponding to an NH bond, but basically I'm going to see if I can get what it, use whatever information I have here to solve the structure. 
the first thing I'll do in this situation is try to use the molecular formula to calculate how many pi bonds or rings that I have. So go ahead and do that. I'm not going to do it because I'm going to wait for you to do it. Do you remember what you do for nitrogens when calculating degrees of unsaturation? Add one to what you expect for the fully unsaturated hydrocarbon. So what do you got? You got a number? So four degrees of unsaturation, that's two times eight plus two, which is 18, plus one is 19, minus 11 is eight, divided by two is four. Four pi bonds or rings. Now, just as a rule of thumb, with a molecule this size, only eight carbons, there's not that many ways to get four pi bonds or rings in the molecule. In general, if you have four or more, you wanna be thinking about the possibility of a benzene ring being part of your structure. Now we'll go to the NMR, look at the chemical shifts, uh, integrated peak area and peak shapes. I see a group of peaks here that integrate for five protons, and they're in this highly deshielded region of the spectrum five protons in this area of the spectrum, and the peaks are messy. We'll talk about why that, why that is, but that's almost always, especially if it's five protons, that's almost always a mono-substituted benzene ring. So we're not saying what's attached here. Why do you think the peak shape is so messy here? How many different kinds of protons do I have on that benzene ring? Well, if it were just benzene, it would be one. How about the monosubstituted benzene ring? Is it five? It's not five, it's three. How do you know? Well, by symmetry, these two are identical, these two are identical, and this is its own thing. So why don't I see a pattern of two protons, two protons, and one proton? And the answer is sometimes the chemical shifts are close enough that peaks overlap. If you were gonna predict peak shape for these, this uh, yellow proton is adjacent to the blue one, you would predict some kind of doublet. <laughs> The blue proton is adjacent to two. You might predict some kind of triplet. And the purple proton is adjacent to two, so you might predict some kind of triplet. And if we were to zoom in there, you can sort of see some of that structure. Perhaps this small one is um, the purple proton. In any case, it doesn't matter for our purposes which of these corresponds to which of these peaks. We have enough information to say that we have a monosubstituted benzene ring. And sometimes when, uh, even though you expect three different peaks with these particular shapes, if their chemical shifts are similar enough, those peaks are gonna overlap and the pattern's gonna be difficult to interpret. So one of the skills you have to develop in uh, solving NMR structures or analyzing NMR data is when to worry about something versus when not to worry about something. I realize that strikes a lot of worry in your hearts because now you have to worry about whether or not you should be worrying about something. This is like meta-anxiety, which is not good. Uh, what I mean is, don't try to overinterpret the data and be willing to accept a little bit of ambiguity. And you may need to be able, you may need to have to set something aside while you identify other parts of the spectrum to come up with a, a decent hypothesis. Questions about how we got to this conclusion? So the part I'm choosing not to worry about is the fact that this peak shape is, is not exactly like I would have expected. 
I'm being okay with that because I know that if the chemical shifts of these individual protons are similar enough, the peaks might overlap and the pattern might be difficult to interpret. Um, one other general uh, thing that I usually do with NMR spectra is I start analyzing the peaks at high chemical shift first, uh, in part because those are often the more informative ones. Um, all right. So at around 4 ppm, I have a one proton peak that is our typical one to three to three to one pattern. So this is a single proton. It probably is adjacent to something that's fairly electronegative. <coughs> and it is also adjacent to what? If it's a quartet, it's got to have what? Three, three protons adjacent to it. Now there's, I suppose, multiple ways you could do that. For example, you could have a single proton adjacent to three other single protons, though that's a fairly complicated arrangement and we have only a limited number of carbons in our molecule, five of six of eight we have uh, accounted for with the benzene ring. So something like this that depends on the presence of not only a carbon that bears the CH group, but also three other carbons. We're basically running out of carbons for that kind of thing. So a more likely and simple solution is just an adjacent methyl group. So now we can look elsewhere in the spectrum and see, can we identify a peak that corresponds to a methyl group that's adjacent to just one proton. And we got that one here, right? This three proton uh, doublet, which would be consistent with the methyl group protons adjacent to just one hydrogen. Okay, so we have <coughs> these pieces that we're fitting together. We also have another two proton peak that if you zoom in is sort of a broad singlet. And, and we'll, as we try to deduce what the structure of this molecule is, we'll come back and talk about why we see a peak here of that kind. All right. So let's start putting the pieces together, generating some hypotheses. So what should I connect this pink carbon to? Pink carbon's connected to a proton, a methyl group, and then two other things. One of them is a benzene ring, so that's a pretty good bet. So let's just start to draw this and see. All right. Let's see if we've accounted for all of the carbons. We need eight, so six from the benzene, seven and eight. Let's see if we've accounted for all of the hydrogens, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We're missing two, and uh, those two missing protons are these ones, but I'm not totally sure what should be here. And in part, this is a little confusing because whatever this group is, if it has those two protons, I'm worried because I would have thought that those two protons would also split this one. Okay, but let's see what else we've got. Um, I said we accounted for eight carbons, nine of 11 hydrogens, and no, uh, and we haven't accounted for the nitrogen yet. So what's a possibility? What could I do? How about I just put an NH2 here? All right. That does, in fact, take into account all of the atoms here. Let's look and just see whether that should help explain the chemical shifts that I see. 
this proton at uh, 4 ppm, you would expect to be adjacent to something that's electronegative. And indeed it is in our structure. The one piece of information that I'm uncomfortable with, well, there's two pieces of information I'm uncomfortable with. First, these two protons here on that amino group, I would have predicted that they would be a doublet, right? Because they're adjacent to one hydrogen. And then for this hydrogen, I would have predicted, since it's adjacent to three, four, and five, I would have predicted a more complicated splitting pattern th than that, okay? So why am I not seeing that? Any ideas? Go ahead. Electroneg do electronegative atoms shield from splitting? Okay, when have we looked at an oxygen hydrogen bond before? I'm trying to remember. I mean, so the answer is I think what you're saying is sometimes we don't see splitting of atoms on, of hydrogens on heteroatoms. Yes, and that's true, but it's true in the same way that, um, but it's, it's true, but not always, which I know is an idea that doesn't um, necessarily sit with you very well. So we'll talk about it just a little bit. Okay, um, it's kind of a, well, anyway. So the answer is yes, protons that are on electronegative heteroatoms sometimes don't split, okay? Um, sometimes they do. So how can you tell whether that's happening or not? Um, so we need to talk about why they might sometimes not split. And the answer to this is that protons on electronegative heteroatoms, which are like nitrogen and oxygen in general, are what we're going to call exchangeable. What does that mean? Um, well, suppose we have a sample of alcohol and let's imagine it's a highly hydrogen bound sample such that the oxygen on one alcohol is hydrogen bound to, the, to a proton on an adjacent alcohol. And you've got this rapidly fluctuating network of I don't know, something like this, a rapidly fluctuating network of hydrogen bonding. We talked about this before, I think, a long time ago when we were mentioning hydrogen bonding and how, hmm, I don't actually like what we did here. Let's just have, that be a hydrogen bond. Um, I think we mentioned this in chapter three when we were talking about non-covalent interactions. Uh, hydrogen bonding can rapidly switch back and forth from a hydrogen bond to a full covalent bond. For example, if I draw in the lone pairs on the oxygens, you can see how it could happen very rapidly that without moving really any of the atoms, all of the hydrogens change positions, right? So, okay. 
I'm sorry to be sniffling so much, by the way. Allergy season is not great for me. I've spent some time outside mowing, well, not mowing the lawn, edging the lawn and stuff like that, and now all of a sudden my nose is a running faucet, which is disgusting, and I'm very sorry. I take Benadryl, but I have out-of-body experiences when I'm taking Benadryl. <laughs> Boy, there was a, years ago, I was on a, Sunday, I took two Benadryl so that I wouldn't be dripping all over the place, and I also had to play the organ and sacrament meeting that day, and it was all I could do to stay focused enough to continue to play the notes. It was really strange. Um, anyway, let's see, we got the same number of, yeah. So what I'm intending to show here is simply that without doing a whole lot, we're trading which hydrogen is attached to which oxygen, okay? Now, that uh, back and forth is fast. Now, let's think about what splitting comes from, right? Splitting comes from the fact that, on average, these protons, we'll call them B, who are adjacent to proton A, get to experience two possible environments, one in which purple proton is aligned with the external magnetic field, and one in which purple proton is aligned against the magnetic field. And we've said that in about 50% of cases you'll be here, about 50% of cases you'll be there, and that's why, if there was nothing else here, we'd expect these B protons to be split into a doublet. But if proton A is coming on and off the molecule quickly, then on average, proton B actually doesn't see anything. It sees an average of those two environments or rather just one adjacent environment. In other words, for splitting to occur, that adjacent proton has to be there for a certain amount of time. Long enough, we say, on the NMR time scale. So if exchanging of hydrogen-bound protons with adjacent molecules is fast. On average, um, proton B experiences just one environment instead of two, and so it's not split by those adjacent protons, okay? So this would be a case in which hydrogen bonding is such between different uh, protons on amino, amino groups on adjacent molecules <coughs> that overall the proton on this purple carbon doesn't, oh, doesn't experience uh, the different environments associated with these two protons because they're coming on and off all the time. It just experiences one environment. Yeah. Four pi bonds or rings. So three pi bonds and one ring. Yep. Yes? I was just curious. I think that was a good explanation of the splitting pattern, but why is it taking so far uh, right to the ring versus purple and white? What's the difference? Why is the chemical shift of these protons so far to the right? Yeah. Yeah, and that's also weird. It turns out that protons that are directly attached to electronegative atoms their chemical shift is highly environment dependent and it can be anywhere in this region, okay? Uh, it gets worse because we haven't talked about at all um, what solvent you use for the NMR experiment. So why don't, we, why don't we do that now? Suppose this molecule is not a liquid. I don't actually know if it's a liquid or not. Um, to do the NMR experiment, you need to dissolve it in solution, and then you put the tube that has the solution inside the magnet, and you run the experiment. Um, but you can see right away why, th why it would be a bad idea to take, for example, this molecule, and then let's say we dissolve it in, I don't know, um, do, do, do. fine, let's dissolve it in benzene. Benzene's a liquid, right? 
Now, normally when we're dissolving something, uh, the molecule we're interested in has a concentration in the um, millimolar range, whereas the concentration of your solvent is pretty high. To calculate the concentration of solvent, you need to know the density of the solvent and then its um, molecular weight, and you can figure out how many moles per, per unit volume. And uh, basically, it's really high. I don't know what it is for benzene. For water, for example, water is 55 molar. Um, and we know that the signal we see in an NMR experiment is proportional to the number of protons that are being observed. So if we were to use a solvent like benzene uh, for this, and we, what we would do is, what we would see is that the signal, the protons from our solvent would totally overwhelm the protons from our molecule of interest. Like there would be a massive peak here representing all of the protons from your benzene solvent and you might not even be able to see uh, corresponding portions from your molecule of interest. So what we do to solve this problem is instead of using benzene, we use what's called deuterated solvent. That is, we replace all of the protons in our solvent with deuterium, which is an isotope of hydrogen. Deuterium is also uh, an NMR active nucleus. It doesn't, it's uh, a little bit more complicated than hydrogen. Hydrogen has a, is a, what we call a spin one half nucleus. Deuterium is a spin one nucleus. Deuterium has more allowed spin states than hydrogen does. But the bottom line is deuterium does not show up in the same part of the NMR spectrum as hydrogen does. So if you use what's called a deuterated solvent or uh, D6 benzene, deuterated benzene, you no longer have to worry about overwhelming the signals from your protons in your molecule with corresponding protons from solvent. All right, now, um, okay, so when you do an NMR experiment, you'll uh, often be using some kind of uh, deuterated solvent. Why are we even, t even talking about this? Well, um, sometimes your deuterated solvents can also hydrogen bond with your molecule of interest. D6 benzene, these are not, uh, particularly good hydrogen bonding donors. But imagine instead if our solvent was um, CD3OD. Suppose it was deuterated methanol. Okay. Now, remember what I told you about the ability of protons involved in hydrogen bonding to exchange with each other. Now imagine what will happen if I have my molecule that I'm interested in. Sorry, here's the methyl group, here's the hydrogen, here's the nitrogen. Nitrogen has lone pairs. So let's just suppose that this nitrogen is now hydrogen bonding with my deuterated solvent. Oops. Some sort of vast hydrogen bonding network. And if that exchange is rapid, I can expect a lone pair on that nitrogen to pull a deuterium off um, one of my molecules of deuterated solvent. And then you could imagine this whole exchange process happening. 
And in so doing, what would happen now is I would have lost some deuterium to my, uh, to my organic molecule. I would have replaced one hydrogen on the nitrogen with deuterium. Uh, now I'm very confused. Oh well. That's not it, is it? That's right. That's fine. Yep, close enough. Yeah, okay. So now I've replaced one of my hydrogens on my molecule that I'm interested in with deuterium, and the other hydrogen went off to be part of solvent. And this happens quite rapidly, and so if I use a deuterated solvent that can engage in hydrogen bonding, pretty soon after some amount of time, what I've actually got is both of those protons that used to be on the electronegative heteroatom have now been replaced with deuterium and now those two protons are now gone from my spectrum. Sorry, I guess I should use a different color. So these protons are now fully exchanged with deuterium and the peak for the NH2 group in my NMR spectrum is now going to be gone. This process is called hydrogen deuterium exchange and uh, so it's one of the reasons why if I were using a deuterated solvent I might not even see that peak. Okay? So here are the levels of complexity for protons on um, electronegative heteroatoms, right? Their chemical shift is just all over the place. They sometimes split adjacent protons. And if in deuterated solvent, They disappear. <laughs> so basically you don't want to put a huge amount of stock in interpreting the NMR data from protons on electronegative heteroatoms. It'll be highly context dependent. Sometimes you will see them depending on your solvent. Sometimes they will split with adjacent protons. Other times they will not. Yeah? What? Why is it a broad peak? Because um, this exchange process makes, uh, I told you that on average then, because purple proton is hopping on and off this molecule all the time, on average the B protons see one kind of environment, but it's spread out a little bit because and whether or not it's broad or narrow actually varies as well, and it has to do with how strong the hydrogen bonding is and how fast the exchange is. Okay, so, I mean, there's all kinds of uh, issues here, but what I'm trying to illustrate is often you're going to need to use the information in the larger spectrum to compensate for the weirdness you're gonna see with protons attached to electronegative heteroatoms. And if you're just prepared to anticipate a little bit of weirdness for protons attached to electronegative heteroatoms, then I think you'll probably be fine. All right, questions you wanna ask about that? Or other things? Yeah. No. But on, no. No. Um, the perp, the, well, let's just call this the purple hydrogen is not being split by the green hydrogens, and the green hydrogens are not being split by the purple hydrogen. So why do they show up as two different hydrogens? Are they splitting each 
these two? Yeah. No, they're not. A singlet just means, for our purposes, a singlet is, oh, you're not adjacent to any protons. Um, the fact that these protons are coming on and off rapidly means that um, green proton is never around specific this individually labeled green proton is never around the purple proton long enough for you to see two different environments because it's coming on and off so rapidly. I don't think I'm explaining that very well. You know, who really knows this stuff is my colleague, Professor Scott Burt. And uh, uh, if you want to know even more about this, you can take chemistry 455 on your way to taking 552, right? No, <laughs> seriously, no, okay, yeah. Uh, Oh, yeah. Well, I don't know what you're going to do about that. Me <laughs> um, I'm sorry. I think I somehow got, basically I mixed up. The study guide is correct. Don't worry about what it's called. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, the text has gone through multiple editions. The radicals chapter, which is chapter whatever we're talking about here, whether it's 21 or 22, uh, used to be chapter 15, so I'm just confused is actually what's going on, and um, I believe it's chapter 21 in your text. Yeah. Okay. Good. Let's do a few more. Okay. This looks fun. Uh, peak in the IR says maybe carbonyl group, double bond equivalence looks like, let's see, 2 times 9, 18, 25. Am I counting that right? Five double bond equivalents, five degrees of unsaturation. A five proton signal in the benzene region suggests a mono substituted benzene ring. That accounts for four of my five double bond equivalents. Go ahead. Sorry, um, the pattern is different. Yes, and the pattern of splitting, how is, well, the pattern of these peaks really depends on how different the chemical shifts of these protons are. And that will depend on what this group is here. So the, all the information you need here is really well. It's five and it's in this area consistent with the benzene ring and I know from my molecular formula, I've got five degrees of unsaturation, but only nine carbons. So probably, I mean, it, you, could, you could play around with this. I defy you to come up with an alternative way that has five double bond equivalents in that molecular formula. Um, yes, but you're seeing that the actual pattern of the peaks is different, and that's because the identity of this group does influence the chemical shift of those protons, okay? So um, let's see, I have a now two proton signal. What are we gonna do with this? It's, it's, it's a quartet, but it's, it's a weird quartet. It's, it's kind of leaning, like Joe Jr. from While You Were Sleeping, but none of you even know what that is anymore. Go figure that out, go figure that out, go watch it, you'll thank me. Anyway, it's not exactly a one to three to three to one quartet. That's okay, a little bit of leaning is allowed. So we'll just call this a quartet. It's a CH2 group, and it's a quartet. That means it, we would expect it to be adjacent to probably a methyl group. And we see a corresponding three proton pattern that is a triplet. So that's the sort of reciprocal information I'm telling you about, the complementary information. Both of these peaks are consistent with there being an ethyl group. Okay, um, so let's see. We have accounted for five, six, seven, no, yes, six, seven, eight, eight of our nine carbons, and actually all nine of them, because one of them is this carbonyl group. So in terms of pieces that we have to put together, we've got the benzene ring, you've got the carbonyl group, 
you've got the ethyl group, and then if you look at our molecular formula, what's left over is an oxygen. So we've got some potential uh, mechanistic hypotheses we could come up with. Let's just sort of click those pieces together in all of the possible orientations. I've got that option. Let's see what else. I've got my missing other options that are consistent with the splitting pattern. Did you have the O at the end? What's wrong with that? Splitting pattern, right? Yeah, the, the, the CH2 has got to be next to the CH3. So you're right. I mean, th this is a valid molecule. Probably in this list of spectra, that one is actually there. But if you were going to do that, you'd expect singlet and singlet. So uh, at least in terms of splitting pattern, we expect to see uh, quartet and triplet, quartet and triplet. The difference, though, is in option one, my quartet should be adjacent to a carbonyl group, which would mean if I know some things about chemical shift, uh, I'm going to expect that to be in the two to two and a half ppm area of my spectrum. Here, my quartet is adjacent to an oxygen, which puts me in the three to four ppm region. So. What are my data consistent with? Yeah, three to four, four and a half. Yeah, so that's probably this one. The CH2 group is adjacent to the oxygen, um, and so its chemical shift should be in that three to four region. Okay, so solving the spectrum, you're gonna need a lot of practice on that. So um, your text has tons of this, not only in the spectroscopy chapter, but basically every other chapter from here on out, meaning not every other one like alternating ones, but all of the, all of the chapters now have NMR problems in them. So if you need more practice, just flip through the textbook to the other chapters and, and when it gets to NMR, you've got a whole new set of problems you can do. Yeah. Will there always be the number of hydrogens next to the peak? No, sometimes you will have to do this kind of thing where you just have to interpret it as best you can. I look at that and I see two to three to three or maybe four to six to six. And that's based on the height of the It's based on, sort of, it's based on the area under the peak. Yeah. I remember when interpreting peak area information, one significant figure is probably all you need. So 18 equals 20, always. 32 equals 30. 34 and a half also equals 30. Sometimes 36 equals 30. <laughs> okay, um, now I wanna show you an example of some uh, questions that you can use to try to, or rather give you an example question that um, doesn't necessarily rely on the solving of an NMR spectrum, but it, has to, it allows you to try to under, use what you know about molecular symmetry to uh, to try to understand what's going on. Uh, okay. Uh, I don't know. It's a good question. It should be, should have, it should maybe be, we can look it up. This is called 18 annuline. Uh, annular, annual ring. I mean, it's from the Latin or Greek for whatever, for ring. Um, I will tell you this molecule is like benzene. It possesses benzene special stability. How many different kinds of protons are there in this molecule? Eh. 
There are two. There's two different environments, right? There's inside the ring and there's outside the ring. Now you're right, by resonance, all of the protons on the outside are identical to each other and all of the protons on the inside are identical to each other. Ah, now here is the fun question. Do you remember what I told you about benzene and the ring current and how in the presence of an external magnetic field, the current in the benzene ring uh, circulates in such a way as to generate field lines within the ring that oppose the external magnetic field, but outside the ring where the protons are reinforce the external magnetic field. So such that you would predict this proton here to be very de-shielded and show up in the sort of seven to eight ppm region of the spectrum. Two different kinds of protons in 18 aniline which should have the higher chemical shift? One's on the outside. Because if you draw the ring current uh, and the field lines, inside the ring is going to be where the field lines oppose the external magnetic field. So these in here are going to be shielded, and these out here are going to be de-shielded. Um, let's see, I've got the number here. Oh, wow, this is awesome. So um, 9 ppm for the ones outside. For the ones inside, minus 1.8. What's negative? Negative just means, I mean, these are all relative numbers, right? It's all relative to some average reference proton. So this just means it's more shielded than your average proton. Oh, so it's supposed to be a red-brown crystalline solid. Interesting, this annuline. Okay, we'll see you next time. That, that concludes our NMR stuff.